Currently, I'm teaching a qualitative research methods class in sociology, and the topic of this current module is interviewing. So I just wanted to make a little video about talking about the main points of interviewing participants. I myself am a qualitative researcher, and I've been interviewing participants for over 20 years on my various projects. And so I just wanted to talk about the basic points of conducting an e interview. Each of these points, as simple as they seem, provide an opportunity for problems at each stage of the process. So interviewing, first of all, you have to decide what your research questions are. What is the information that you're trying to discover? Therefore, all of the questions need to be oriented towards this final objective. So you can have a very structured questionnaire and you can have a very unstructured questionnaire. And so usually for me, I have about, say, 15 different questions. I have a demographics questions. And then um, I basically have them tell me a life story based on whatever topic at hand. And so from the beginning of their life, as, it, as this topic entered their life, what has the process of development been over time? So usually I do have a very structured question set. Like I said, about 15 questions. Um, my interviews should be about an hour. And if someone's really chatty, maybe an hour and a half. And it goes back to the beginning of their life process when, um, you know, that particular social phenomenon started. So usually how they were raised, I usually am asking about their early childhood um, context and especially their parents, what their parents did for a living, and, and even their parents' attitude towards that topic at hand. So the first thing, of course, is finding participants and, well, the first thing, of course, if you're in an academic or university setting is the institutional review board process. And I think I'll just bracket that off for another time. So this is assuming you've already written your proposal for research, you've already written your IRB institutional review board application, they've probably come back at you and asked for revisions, and even in their plan, they ask for the consent form, they ask for the research questions, they ask you for um, your letter of introduction to participants, they ask you for your plan of how you're gonna find participants. And so you've already written that part in that proposal. But now when you're actually starting to do the research is when reality uh, comes to the foreground because perhaps you have envisioned how you'll find participants, but in reality, uh, you don't know how difficult that could be. So when you're trying to find participants for whatever your study topic is, you wanna have a diverse sampling within that of all the possible outcomes, all the potential possible people that could be involved within that category of social topics. And also what I think is important and what I myself have had trouble with in the past is finding people that maybe would be involved in that topic, but for some reason were excluded, they were pushed out, they were, um, you know, wanted to be involved in that, but they um, decided later that they weren't going to do that for whatever reason. And so I think that's really in interesting information. For example, people that were involved in it and then left, or people who want to be involved in it but already face some barriers. And so what does that look like? So who are the people that might be here but either didn't make it in or came in and left? I think that those people um, can really provide some interesting insights. You should be able to graph you know, the range of diverse experiences. And so this could be demographic information, uh, dim different demographic backgrounds, but also just the range of potential experiences because what you want to do is get enough participants that you start to hear repeated stories, but you want the whole variety of potential stories within that topic and then you want to start hearing repeats and then you know that you've saturated the information and that you have enough interviews. And so for me when I do a qualitative research project that's going to result in um, you know, an article or a book, I'm probably interviewing about 50 people. And for my projects, I'm not getting these big grants or anything. I'm just one researcher. And usually I do everything myself. I don't have a team of graduate students. I work at a teaching liberal arts school. 
so I'm doing everything myself. So 50 interviews is about uh, my capacity for interviewing the people, for getting transcripts, for analyzing the data, writing it up, and so on. So once you've found participants and they agree to talk to you, then you probably have some back and forth over phone or email um, about setting up the place for the interview, setting a date, uh, and setting a location. And so the next challenge is to get your participant to show up. I mean, at this stage, people might stand you up or they might cancel or they might reschedule. And so this could be quite a process in itself. And so that's why I'm saying at every stage, there can be a lot of you know problems. And so even just trying to set up an interview, people might flake out, you might go there, they're not there, they might reschedule. So it might be a more of a time consuming process than you anticipated. So then you wanna find a location that is both comfortable for the participant and yourself. And of course, I think the comfort of the participant is the most important. But I think one of the worst strategies that I've seen is for example, someone who was interviewing a marginalized population and they had these participants meet them in their academic university office. So that's prior prioritizing the comfort and ease of the researcher, their office, and making the participant coming to this strange environment, find parking, find the office, and go into this very formal atmosphere. This reminds me of you know the psychology studies that would be done having people come into a laboratory where the um, you know the lab workers are the most empowered people in that context. So for me as an ethnographer, I really want to go into the participant space and into the ethnographic field. So for example, I was interviewing women tattoo artists. So I'm going to go to their shop. I'm going to go to their place of employment, their place that's relevant to the study at hand, which is their work environment. And of course that has its own problems. For example, in my women tattoo artist study, um, you know, we're going into a tattoo shop, say there's five different artists that work there and the woman is one of the artists. So you have an atmosphere, you know, an open floor plan say, and there's other artists in the space. And in this case, um, when I was doing this research, the majority of artists were male artists. And so if perhaps these male artists are just a bit ticked off that I'm a woman researcher going in to interview um, the woman tattoo artist. And so they might be in the background like making noise and playing music and stuff like that just to, um, you know, maybe not thinking about the context of our interview or um, being a bit passive aggressive. So that just creates, you know, you have to think about the context of the space, who else is in the room, what's the noise level like, what's the distraction like. And for me especially, I like to use video in my research and I'm often making videos and creating documentaries. So the sound and the noise in the background really uh, interferes with my process of recording video. Continuing with um, finding a location for your interview, some people might want to find a neutral location such as a coffee shop or a park. But in a coffee shop, I mean, I would be really distracted by people in the room. It's not a private space. And usually I'm interviewing people that are, um, you know, part of a, a some kind of subculture. And so we would be, you know, um, aware of the people around us in that room that are listening in. So I would not want to do an interview in a coffee shop. And also it's just distracting, it's noisy, it's not a private location. So at any rate, you have to find a location that's conducive to conducting an interview, but hopefully the, the space itself should be reflective of the topic at hand. And so if possible, interview the participant in their location. So finally, you are meeting your participant, they showed up, you're in the same place, and you're just greeting each other, and probably for the first time in person, or maybe on Zoom. And so what you wanna do is um, you know, build a rapport, make that person feel comfortable. So you have to be warm and inviting, you have to really pay attention to them, you know, provide uh, eye contact, and really, um, you know, make that social human connection so that they feel comfortable talking to you because you're ultimately trying to get them to really open up to you and tell them about their own life 
and so you want to make them as comfortable as possible. Now, of course, there's contexts in which you're having maybe a more of an antagonistic or confrontational interview where you're researching someone um, from the other side. And so that's, um, you know, a different kind of situation. But ultimately, you're probably trying to make that person feel comfortable. You also want to make sure that you are really paying attention to them and giving them your undivided attention. So you wouldn't want to be, you know, on your phone distracted when you really want your full focus on them. So once you've sat down with your participant, you're being warm and friendly, you're engaging them, now you hand them the consent form and you get them to read it and to sign off on it. And if you're meeting in person, that's super easy. You just hand them the paper, you let them read it, you explain any questions they might have, they sign it and you take it. However, um, post COVID and just doing research that might be in different geographic areas, international, what have you, you're not in the same location as your participant, you might interview them on Zoom or you might interview them on the phone. And so therefore you are emailing them a consent form. You want them to print it, sign it, scan it, email it back to you, and then you print it and put it in your files. Because I'm conducting interviews on Zoom most often nowadays, and I cannot for the life of me get the participant to send me back a signed consent form. Most people now in this current era don't have printers. So it's just not convenient for folks to print out something, sign it, scan it. Maybe they want to do an e-signature or something like that. But I just cannot believe how difficult it is to get people to sign a consent form. And it's not malicious or anything. They're like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to send it to you. And so often I do the interview uh, before you know, I get the signed consent form. Ideally, it would be great to get the signed consent form before you start the interview process. But usually it's like we do the interview, they're warm and friendly, they say on camera and on the recording device, of course I consent to the interview, which is another point, is just get a verbal consent if you are recording on video or audio so that at least you have that. So now you're with your participant, they've shown up, they've greeted you, they've signed the consent form, and now you start the interview process. And of course you already have your list of questions. And we're, as sociologists, we're first going to ask demographic questions. So you want to walk your participant through your questions and you want to, um, and you want to say your question in the most conversational manner. You don't want to sound like a robot just reading this question like a, a computer or a telephone surveyor. And so while I'm interviewing someone, I might alter the questions over the course of the conversation because they've already answered certain parts of the question or what have you, that information has already been stated. Generally, I start an interview with asking them about the context in which they grew up and how that relates to the current topic. So for example, interviewing tattoo artists, I asked them when they were a child, um, were there people in their life that had tattoos? Did that person have artistic ambitions as a child? Did their parents have tattoos? What were their parents' attitude towards tattoos? So this provides the early context of how that person was brought up to relate to this topic. And then of course, as they became an adult, how that changed over time. So we wanna understand that early childhood context. So while you're doing the interview, of course, you have to be capturing that data. And so um, having a recording device, having a video camera, having an audio recorder is of course the standard practice. And then you can have that transcribed. But sometimes you might just have a pen and a paper. And so you have to take some shorthand notes, but while you're still engaging with your participant and giving them that kind of um, feedback, uh, you have to really you know, be quick in recording what what shorthand notes you can take. So in this case, if you're taking handwritten notes, then right after the interview, I would take those shorthand notes and really write out the long form of all of the details that I can remember as soon as possible, because you don't want time to pass after you do an interview and um, before you forget everything. 
And so usually in these kinds of qualitative sociological interviews, we are trying to create a more comfortable environment where that person can really share their experience at hand. And also as the interviewer, you don't want to talk very much. You want to encourage them to talk. Of course, this is about them and not about you. But as the interviewer, you might give a little tidbits of information about yourself and your background that relate to the topic at hand and that build that um, relationship with the participants so that they can understand where you're coming from, why you're un researching this topic, and um, you know, say something that's relevant. But you really want to keep that to the minimum. So once you've achieved that kind of connection with your participant, that's enough. The more details you impart about your yourself, your own perspective, that might influence your participant. And so maybe you have you know a different perspective on something, and then they realize that, and so that could just cause some kind of you know conflict or um, alter the information that they provide you. So I would say keep that to a minimum and just as much as you need to achieve that kind of connection with your participant. And maybe later after the interview is completed, you can say like, oh, I really related to that story or, oh, other people said a different, you know, um, had a different take on that topic. And then once you've completed all of these interviews, you have to, you know, collect your data together. Now as technology progresses, I'm sure that um, people are able to take some kind of audio interview and maybe just have uh, a computer transcribe it or something, although the punctuation and readability might be questionable. The last time I did a batch of interviews, I still had them sent out to a company to transcribe. That cost about $60 per transcript. And then I did 50 of them. And like I said, I don't have grant money or any of that. so. Uh, the cost can really add up. You need to have your interviews transcribed, written up, so that now you can look over the data. Perhaps some people use some kind of computer software to code their data and come up with, you know, coding categories and things that you're looking at, the details of the information you're trying to find within these interviews. You have to have some kind of process of coding that and then collecting those categories together over all your interviews and then of course uh, writing up your data. You have already read all of the literature in the field so you have the literature that will contextualize your interviews and then you have now this interview data that you'll incorporate into your academic writing. You write your article, you write your book proposal and then send it off to a publisher and that process of course can take a really long time. You send it out to an academic journal, you send it out to a book publisher. Nowadays there's a lot fewer academics that are willing to review articles so this process might take a long time and then you get your rejection letter back or your revise and re resubmit letter, revise it, resubmit it, get another one. Uh, it's just a very it's just a very lengthy process of getting your academic writing published and especially for folks that are on the tenure track or that have some kind of compelling timeline such as you know applying for jobs um, you know it's it's important to really start as early as possible so you write up your information you um, get it published you present it at a conference and then um, you know that completes the process so in my class for an assignment on this topic of how to conduct interviews, what I did even on the first day of class was have the students pair up and interview each other about uh, what brought them to this college, what was their decision-making process, and how their experiences have been at our college. So I didn't give them more of a prompt than that. They had to leave the classroom, find a place to interview each other, and this was day one, like I said, so they hadn't read anything about how to do an interview. And I just wanted to throw them into the activity and see uh, what questions they had afterwards or how um, they thought certain aspects were easy or difficult and just ask them about their experience in general. And this was a way then, and out after the interview, they would introduce the other person to the class and write up a summary both of the um, biography of the student in which they interviewed, as well as a reflection on the process and experience of conducting the interview. 
And so usually in my classes, what I have students do is write a sociological autobiography where they talk about their personal um, history, but within a sociological context of say, for example, statistics about your hometown and such. So many of these students had already done their sociological autobiography assignment, and so this was a way in which um, the students got together, they were engaged with each other, they met someone in the classroom, and, um, you know, a participatory activity. And then they had the responsibility of introducing this classmate to uh, the classroom, and so that added another layer of um, responsibility to the assignment. So let me know what you're working on as far as ethnographic research and the interview process. What kinds of topics are you interviewing folks on? And um, you know, what, what problems have you had during these uh, steps of the process? So thank you for joining me and I look forward to hearing what you're working on.